please um, do let us know where you're from in the world in the chat. And just um, a quick note, if you've got questions, please pop them in the chat. Robin will try and answer as many of your questions as, as he can, and we will as well. And um, we're very much looking forward to meeting you all. Just a quick show of hands, we might put the gallery on and see who hasn't been at a Mind Medicine Australia event previously. Hands up if you have not been at a Mind Medicine Australia event previously. And welcome to all of you. It's really special for us to be here today with um, Dr. Robin Carhart Harris, Professor Robin Carhart Harris. I think you are now Professor, aren't you? You can unmute yourself, Robin. <laughs> yes, yes, I am. <laughs> Professor. Yes. Professor, it's so wonderful. And um, so, what I'm going to be doing now is just showing you just a short few introductory videos, sorry, um, screens. And just a reminder that firstly, we'd like to acknowledge the lands from which we all come from, our elders past and present, and also the wisdom and light keepers, the people who've brought these medicines to us to the present day, which have been healing us and raising our consciousness since the beginning of human civilizations. We acknowledge all of them and we stand on their shoulders. We do record these webinars and we have a YouTube channel where you can watch this and share it with others. We don't encourage any illegal use of psychedelics. Our focus is wholly clinical. So we have this shocking mental health epidemic, certainly in Australia and many other parts of the world. Pre-COVID, one in five Australian adults had a mental illness. And as a result of the pandemic, it suggested that 34% of Australians said their mental health had declined and four in five Australians are reporting more poor mental health. One in seven Australians are now on antidepressants and that's been a huge increase over the last decade or so with one in 30 kids on antidepressants as young as four years of age and prescriptions have doubled over the past decade. Australia is the second highest user of antidepressants of all OECD nations. It's expected that one in two of us will have a mental illness in our lifetimes. And unfortunately, these statistics are far worse for veterans, first responders, and some other professions who have a far higher incidence of mental illness and addiction, suicidality. We also see this terrible situation where a first responder is taking their own life every six weeks. There's a massive impact of mental illness on supporters, carers, families, and adults with mental illness are far more likely to be unemployed, to be homeless, and to potentially and tragically take their own lives. The cost to the Australian economy of mental illness and suicide at last count was $220 billion. Imagine if we could save some of that money and put it back into the system to give people their lives back. The elephant in the room for over 50 years is the lack of innovation in treatments. You can see that elephant trying to get the attention of the bureaucrats. And the bureaucrats talk about training more psychologists, more psychiatrists, providing new access gateways. But those things are not necessarily going to get people well because if we can't get to the root cause of a person's suffering, we can't get them well and out of the system. And that's why we see this incredible backlog and these waiting lists and closed books of many psychologists, psychiatrists, and so on with waits of a year and a half or two years or more in many places, particularly in rural and regional areas as well. So in the case of depression, only 30 to 35% of sufferers experience remission from existing treatments. Relapse is common, side effects are significant and in the case of post-traumatic stress disorder, remission rates are as low as 5% from existing treatment. So clearly, more of the same is not going to solve the problem. We're a charity set up by my husband, Peter Hunt, and I to expand the treatment options available to practitioners and their patients. And we know that there's a lot of practitioners on this call. We'll do a show of hands later. We acknowledge each and every one of you for the incredible work you do in caring for your patients. And we really hope that we can provide more tools for all of you through safe and effective psychedelic assisted therapies, which are now being shown to cure a range of mental illnesses. Our primary focus is on psilocybin and medicinal MDMA, that is pharmaceutical grade medicines. 
we also interested in other medicines, but these medicines, these first two medicines mentioned are the ones which are most advanced in clinical trials and have been given breakthrough therapy status by the FDA, which is a very rare designation only given to medicines that could be vastly superior to existing treatments. For us, success means that these therapies become an integral part of our mental health system, that they continue to achieve the incredibly high remission rates they've been achieving in trials, and I'm sure Robin will talk about some of those remission rates, but they're generally averaging around 60 to 80% across a range of trials versus the 30% or the under 10% for PTSD you saw just before. And of course, as a charity, we want these treatments to be accessible and affordable to all Australians, no matter where they're based or their financial circumstances. The remarkable thing as well about these treatments is that they only require two to three medicinal sessions in contrast to conventional treatments. So this is not a lifetime sentence of a mental illness. It doesn't mean you have to take a medicine for the rest of your life every day or multiple medicines. There is actually a chance to get well. And Robin will talk a lot about that and why that happens. These treatments are considered safe in medically controlled environments and they're non-addictive. These are the MAPS phase three trial results, part one of their phase three trials, which showed that after three MDMA assisted therapy sessions, 67% of participants no longer qualified for a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, and 88% experienced a clinically meaningful reduction in symptoms. These are people who have an average PTSD diagnosis of over 14 years, so we can imagine their suffering. At the moment, part two of this MAPS phase three trial is taking place and apparently is showing similar, if not even better results than the part one. I'm not going to speak about the Imperial Collie trial because I'm sure that Robin is it's his trial and um, we'd love him to, you will speak about it that a bit, I'm sure, won't you, Robin? Absolutely. Sure. Yeah, great. Um, so the big news, of course, is that on February the 3rd, uh, the TGA uh, regulator rescheduled MDMA and psilocybin for medical use for the treatment of certain um, conditions by authorised prescribers, psychiatrists. And this is very exciting. Australia is the first country in the world to achieve this historic outcome at this stage. And we now are in the position where we're speaking to a lot of people in North America and other countries who are taking that decision up to their governments and demanding that their governments also change the classification of these medicines. We're also seeing trials now underway for dementia, anorexia, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, MDMA assisted psychotherapy for alcohol and a range of other addictions, Parkinson's, schizophrenia, autism spectrum disorder and so on. Mind Medicine Australia also unlocked $15 million towards clinical trials, which are currently taking place, seven Australian clinical trials. And we can provide more information about those trials if you're interested. We also have a page on those trials on our website. Oregon also became the first state to legalise psilocybin for therapeutic use in November 2020. And we're seeing many governments starting to become really progressive in this space, which is good news. I'll just change to this next slide. So here's the classification, this historic moment. Here's some of the incredible headlines about Australia. And isn't it wonderful that Australia can actually become a leader in this space? How exciting is that? And um, I'm sure Robin will talk more about his excitement about that as well. And um, Mind Medicine Australia has always been focused on building the ecosystem for these treatments to become available, accessible and affordable. We do that through four key strategic pillars. The first one is education events. At events like these, this free webinar series, we had our major global summit and we're planning another one. State and regional chapters uh, all over Australia to build grassroots awareness, share events, educate the community. We have a leading professional development program. So we, Asia Pacific's first certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies and a number of online courses. We partnered with universities and helped Monash establish its um, Centre for Neuromedicine's discovery. And 
we're looking at ethical and legal frameworks, hence why we did the rescheduling applications to the TGA. And we're looking at the sourcing of medicines. So we've just secured outstanding medicine supplies of GMP grade psilocybin and MDMA from Canada. And that is really exciting because our goal is to make sure that these treatments can be as affordable as possible. We're also working with a lot of clinics on their rollout strategies. And we've set up a patient support fund to support patients who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford these therapies while they're not available through the pharmaceutical benefit scheme. Tim Ferris, who's the person who turned me on to all of this um, field through a blog he wrote uh, some six years ago, um, said that he views the next five years as a golden window in which small amounts of money could have billions of dollars of impact. There's a real opportunity here, ladies and gentlemen, for us all to contribute to this movement, to support patients who need these treatments, to get more people well and leading meaningful and happy lives. How you can help, start conversations, share this webinar and our other educational content. We've got a great learn section on our website. Talk to your doctors and medical practitioners. We're a charity. We're generous and philanthropic, but we cannot do this alone. So small and larger donors are really, really important to us. And I ask each of you, whatever you can do to contribute, please do so. We put these webinars on for free, but they don't cost us nothing. So um, please support us. Talk to your local, state and federal members of parliament and, and attend our upcoming events. This is about the certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies. And you can see all the different uh, professions who are eligible to do this training. We have enormous demand for this course. We've just announced that Dr. Geeta Vade, a psychiatrist in New York, is the new international course director of our CPAC course. And Dr. Ellie Kotler, a psychiatrist in Australia, is the Australian course director. And we've also just announced some outstanding new faculty members, including Dr. Lauren McDonald from Imperial College, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk and Leachia Sky and a number of others, Sarah Reed and others have just joined the faculty as well. So we're super excited about that. And Robin, we will definitely speak to you about being on the faculty too. <laughs> um, and then we also have Australia's first book of psychedelic healing stories, uh, profiling 53 Australians with their healing through these medicines. We have t-shirts, we have beautiful mushroom gift cards, you name it, we have it. And then we have these upcoming free webinars, um, which we'd invite you to join and bring along at least four or five of your friends. The next one with Rick Doblin, which will be very interesting. Um, another one on psychiatrists and psychiatric registrar. So psychedelics for psychiatrists. That will be presented by Dr. Ben Sessa and Ali Kotler, talking about what psychiatrists in Australia need to know so that they can be ready on July the 1st to start um, prescribing and screening patients for these treatments. We have lots of other interesting webinars coming up as well, including on eating disorders, ketamine therapies, and so on. So with that, I'm absolutely thrilled um, and honored to introduce Professor Robin Carhart Harris. He really is one of the leaders in this field globally. Um, his work and his research is highly regarded He's been an incredible supporter to Mind Medicine Australia since the beginning. Um, we love him and we love his work. And um, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Kahad Harris. A big round of applause for him. Thank, Thank you, you, Robin. <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. That was lovely to listen to. You guys are just, uh, you're doing it, aren't you? You're doing it. It's so it's really <laughs> nice to see. It's, it's uh, very impressive. And uh, it's just lovely to see. And, you know, uh, when the news came through about Australia changing the legislature on psychedelics, you guys have been the talk of the town, <laughs> the talk of the globe, the psychedelic <laughs> globe ever since. So congratulations. Oh, no, thank it. you, Rob. You know, we couldn't have done it without all of you guys on our advisory panel on our ambassadors because, you know, the letters and support that all of you gave and all the people on this webinar. I know that many people on here <laughs> wrote submissions to the TGA and we just thank you all because this is not something we could have done without tens of thousands of people 
demonstrating how important this was to them. Mm. Well, it's a, it's an incredible thing, you know, because you're preempting uh, the future and uh, are being first movers on something that is inevitable. That's just, you know, years away in other other countries. So credit to you guys for, in a sense, getting there first. And it's one of those changes that people will look back on in history, I think, and, and think, how could it ever have been, you know, another way? Um, totally. Uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, of course, it's, uh, as you'll hear, as I'll talk about, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, in a sense, it's a, it's a complex treatment because mental illness is a complex phenomenon. And uh, I think recognizing that, uh, first of all, can help explain why perhaps medicine has been so slow to have the impact in mental health that it has had in other domains. Um, but I also think it invites a, a kind of, with a deeper understanding of mental illness, naturally invites a kind of compassion in the understanding that can guide the way that treatment is approached. So um, I've got a slide deck, of course, uh, which I'll try and go. Uh, hosters disable participant screen share. Ah, oh, oh, is it uh, working? Sure. <laughs> uh, I think um, Alain, you'll just need to do it from your from that machine there. Okay, we're doing it. To just there you go. Try now. Try now. Okay, sure. Um, yep, absolutely. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, so how's <laughs> uh, really, we should have a do. How does psychedelic work? Question mark. It's much more <laughs> appropriate because we're scientists and science is iterative and it's self-improving, self-correcting all the time. So, of course, we don't have all the answers. That's part of the job is to, you know, pledge uncertainty if it, in a sense that's kind of the first principle of science is to say i do not know therefore i shall test to better you know approximate reality if you want so anyway um i i do tend to take a mechanistic focus uh to my research um and try and um tackle this question because i think it's important and perhaps again going back to that theme of, um, of you know, progress in medicine, uh, in other domains of medicine, you know, because the, the problems are often easier to kind of mm, discern like a virus and then find a solution, not so with mental health. So sometimes perhaps people don't quite grasp why mechanisms is important. They might say something like, I know it works, you know, I'll do a trial just to demonstrate it, but I already know it works. You know, that, that kind of thinking is a little, little naive. Um, and uh, there's a couple of reasons why mechanisms matter. One is that you can help validate the treatment, show it's not magic, show it, it can be grounded uh, in, um, in neurobiology and in psychology. Um, and also by um, better understanding this question of how the drugs are working, how the treatment's working, we can also realize um, potentially how to improve the treatment um, as well. Um, so there's a few reasons. Oh, we've got a bit of background noise there. We, we also know that, um, you know, if you, if you better understand a solution somewhat, you know, in a sort of interesting sort of reverse way, you can better understand the problem as well. So if you can find an effective solution that's working across diagnostic categories, then perhaps it's saying something about the problem that's being addressed. Anyway, we'll get to that. But where we are right now is to come in at the question of, in a sense, what are psychedelics? I do focus in on a particular category of psychedelics, what you might call the prototypical psychedelics or the classic psychedelics. This includes compounds like LSD, psilocybin, DMT, mescaline. And these are all compounds that have some affinity for, some binding potential for, some stickiness for uh, a certain serotonin receptor, the serotonin 2A receptor. You can see where it's expressed here in the living human brain, 
using positron emission tomography, labeling the receptors uh, in the living human brain. Um, and so all these compounds bind to this uh, 2A receptor, and you can see where they are here, very much highly expressed in the cortex and especially highly expressed in high-level association cortex. Aspects of brain that are most recent, in a sense, most new evolutionarily, these are regions that have expanded most in our species relative to our nearest evolutionary neighbors. So that's where you find the target, the molecular target, if you want, or proteomic target for psychedelics. Um, and psychedelics, yes, they bind to these receptors and they stimulate them. Um, so they don't just bind or bind and block, rather the opposite, they bind and stimulate. And so we call them agonists. Uh, they, agonist is just a term that could, you could replace with a stimulator, you know, serotonin to a receptor stimulators. Uh, okay, so we know that the receptor is important and where it is in the brain, but what's the evidence for its importance? Well, it was discovered in the mid 1980s that there's a tight positive correlation between the affinity of a range of different psychedelics for the serotonin to a receptor and the potency of those drugs. So the higher the affinity, the more potent and the smaller dose you need for it to have its signature psychological effects. We also know that if you block the 2A receptor uh, and then give a psychedelic, people don't trip essentially. And if people are tripping, so to speak, and then you give a blocker of the receptor, you'll abolish or kind of terminate the trip as well. So there's a lot of converging evidence. There's a bit more here looking at uh, using PET imaging in a sophisticated way to look at the proportion of available 2A receptors um, in the living human brain that are occupied by different dosages of psilocybin. So these blobs are all different dosages of psilocybin and they're um, causing varying degrees of occupancy of the 2A receptor and that's correlating with the subjective intensity of the effects of that dose. The more occupancy of receptors, the stronger the drug effects. And so these, uh, this is like kind of sanity check stuff. It's more validation of the principle that the 2A receptor is really central to the action of these classic psychedelic compounds. And what's the etymology? Many of you will know this. Um, it's important to know it because it's telling about the drugs that we're looking at. Psychedelic is a word that conjoins psyche for soul, ancient Greek word for soul, uh, and uh, del well, delic from delos, which means to make clear or evident, to make visible or to make manifest. Um, so psychedelic is meant to connote this property of revealing the psyche, making the psyche clear and visible and evident to conscious awareness. And you might think, isn't it always? <laughs> and I would say, well, haven't you studied your psychoanalysis? <laughs> haven't you made that leap of faith? Um, but the beautiful thing with psychedelics that I, I suppose, you know, many before me have realized and I realized is that psychedelics are such powerful tools for revealing, you know, the deeper nature of the psyche and that indeed the principle that the psyche runs very deep, um, much deeper than we're aware of. Um, is uh, is um, is is true. <laughs> now I'm aware um, increasingly that we need a better definition of psychedelic um, that actually goes in and targets and focuses that assumed core property that was spoken to with the original uh, um, derivation of of the term. Uh, psychedelic. And, and so I'm in the process of developing a new rating scale that I'll call something like the psychedelic rating scale um, to measure and in the process operationally define what we're referring to by psychedelics. And I'm predicting that there'll be a dose dependent relationship between um, the action of classic psychedelics on these experiences um, and uh, other drugs won't uh, show the same strong dose dependency and perhaps would 
show dose dependency on other aspects of um, of experience. So anyway, it's a work in progress, but I think it's an important, very important project because it it's uh, the lack of a good definition is creating some ab ambiguity in the field at the moment and funny ideas about non psychedelic psychedelics, which of course doesn't make any logical sense. Because you can't define these drugs based on just their pharmacology, you need the two components of, yes, their pharmacology, and but also what what are their subjective effects, and that second component really does matter, I think. So, what do psychedelics do uh, beyond working at the serotonin two A receptor? And here, the umbrella term or construct or phenomenon or thing is plasticity and you might look that up in the dictionary and see something like the ability to be shaped or molded so this is the ability for something to be changed it's like it's malleability and that's a very broad property it could apply to a lot of things and actually what's been found with psychedelics is that it does apply to a lot of things you can see changes in the brain that's neuroplasticity and you can see changes in the mind and uh, behavior. So these are just various bits of evidence that speak to this apparent um, quite uh, um, potent effect of psychedelics on these various flavors or markers of plasticity, whether it's the increase in different uh, anatomical components of the neuron and how those neurons communicate with each other, the dendritic components, um, like aerials in a sense, picking up signal. Um, and that's been shown with a variety of different psychedelics, this marked increase in what we call synaptogenesis or even spinogenesis. Um, and other markers here, we're looking at brain-derived neurotrophic factor. We're seeing it doubling in the cortex with um, a 2A agonist psychedelic. Uh, it's very much a cortical phenomenon, this neuroplastic effect, most reliably seen and most markedly seen as an effect in the cortex. And remember, that's where those 2A receptors are most densely expressed. We can also look in a living animal with optical imaging and see this increase in spinogenesis um, quite early on and in a sustained way after a single dose of psilocybin, albeit in just the female uh, mice. Um, and it was uh, evident even over a month on from a single dose of psilocybin, this increase in the communicating components of, of the neuron, the synaptic spines. We can also look at behavior now. So in a sense, jumping outside of the brain and into what the animal is doing. In this case, it's rabbits and they're learning. Um, they're doing associative learning. It's aversive air puffs. Um, and they're, um, their learning rate is accelerated with the administration of the psychedelic LSD. You can see that sharper curve here and then slow down with a drug that has some, albeit non-selective uh, serotonin 2A receptor antagonism or blocking. So block that 2A receptor, the target, and you'll slow down learning, stimulate it with your psychedelic and accelerate that low level learning. So that's you know, an effect on low level learning. Um, implicit learning, if you want. Um, it's a, an effect that's likely um, dose dependent and um, learning dependent. I think it's highly likely that not all aspects of learning can be enhanced and accelerated with psychedelics. And also, of course, there'll be some dose dependency there, as there is on virtually everything. Um, now, this is a pivot to the purple in a sense, and I've collapsed what used to be two slides into one, where I just basically make the point that why might plasticity be functional and under what conditions can it be engaged? And there's a pretty large wealth of evidence that um, what you might call deprivation stress, usually chronic stress paradigms, but not always, um, are um, upregulating the serotonin to a receptor system, both increasing the availability of the receptor or increasing the sensitivity of the receptor to signaling when you give a, a uh, agonist, a 2A agonist um, psychedelic. 
So some of these different types of chronic stress include hypoxia, shortage of oxygen, um, sleep deprivation, social deprivation, maternal uh, deprivation, and, and um, immobilization stress. Um, all the nasty stuff that's done in animal research, but, you know, hopefully with a good reason. And here um, we're seeing this effect on, on the system that psychedelics target and it being upregulated. So what might this imply? Well, to me, it implies that under conditions of significant adversity, um, you are priming the system that is the target of psychedelics. In a, in a sense, the system that psychedelics hijack, because that's what many drugs do. Um, they hijack the natural system. So the natural system itself has likely evolved um, as a response to adversity, as a response to stress, engaging a deep and uh, rapid and uh, marked plasticity, you might say. And also it's just worth noting that the most reliable way to release the endogenous ligand, the naturally occurring uh, chemical that stimulates the 2A receptor is through acute stress. And so a variety of different stresses in an animal, whether it be pinching their tail or you know, dropping them into water or what have you, causes a spike, causes a big release here. You can see a doubling of sudden doubling of the release of serotonin into the synapse with, um, in this case, tail pinch, uh, acute stress. And that's just worth knowing because you prime the system with chronic stress, with adversity. And then, of course, outside of the context of psychedelics, because that's how we should think here, we're just looking at the natural system itself. It's primed for its natural ligand. And what releases that? Well, an acute stressor or engages the plasticity in organism is alert and plastic and can ideally adapt better, you know, in those difficult conditions. Just a reminder as well of um, increases in a marker of plasticity with acute stress. So while chronic stress atrophies the brain quite reliably, um, the hippocampus and the cortex in particular, it's a different picture with an acute stressor in isolation. You'll actually see increases in markers of plasticity. And the same is true, for example, with uh, electroconvulsive therapy can increase uh, um, cortical BDNF, to my knowledge. So it's just setting a context for psychedelics, I suppose, in the context of stress and presenting this model that these are drugs that hijack a uh, stress response system. Um, there we are. Okay, so that was a lot on the details, but again, you know, it's a reminder, really, of what I'm trying to do is is lay the groundworks. In a sense, it's a it's a grounding agenda to show that there is this natural system, what it's likely evolved for, and what psychedelics are doing as drugs that come in and hijack this natural system. So let's make that segue to the therapeutic work now, um, and uh, here we're looking. Just at an overview slide, because this um, work's always updating, new studies coming through with positive signal uh, in different indications with psychedelic therapy. I am focusing almost entirely, I think, on psilocybin therapy here and emphasizing some take home messages. Um, one is that all of these studies, to my knowledge, manipulate the context in a positive way, usually, if not always, with music listening. Uh, usually, if not always, with mental health professionals sat with the individuals throughout, also preparing them psychologically beforehand and providing what we call integration support afterwards as well. So that positive context is a staple in the um, psychedelic therapy trials that have been performed. Um, and that's important uh, to know because otherwise you might misunderstand psychedelic medicine and think that the drugs themselves in isolation are therapeutic and there's no evidence for that, to my knowledge, because of all of the modern studies have involved that combination of drug and psychological support or psychotherapy. Uh, the other take home message is that the action is rapid. The improvements appear very quickly. Uh, here we're just showing our data from uh, the first treatment resistant depression study with psychedelic therapy of the modern era where um, we used psilocybin therapy and saw these 
rapid improvements the next day. And they were relatively enduring, um, albeit with some variability across time. Um, so rapid and enduring positive change, and then this transdiagnostic element as well, improvements in a lot of different domains of mental health, well-being, um, end of life distress, addiction, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder. Now, eating disorders and chronic pain and other indications are being looked at as well. So exciting times. Um, and that transdiagnostic action is, is one of the reasons why we're all getting, many of us, uh, getting quite excited about psychedelic therapy and its potential to positively impact mental health care. So what are the components of the, what are the psychological components of the therapeutic process? What are the salient components? Here we have found that emotional breakthrough, what you might call emotional catharsis, um, are especially important. The stronger those emotional catharsis, the stronger the psychological insight that's scored the next day, and the bigger the improvements in um, mental health um, as a result. That's in one study in quite a large sample of over 200 people, naturalistic surveying study. Um, and then uh, you can go into more detail to the um, to the Therapeutic Alliance and Rapport. This is in a control study now, our psilocybin therapy for depression study, and see that um, ratings of psychological, um, or rather of therapeutic rapport, um, are, um, uh, are predicting the uh, improvements in uh, emotional breakthrough en route to the um, decreases in depressive symptom severity there. Um, so just emphasizing another component of the therapeutic process, which is the uh, therapeutic rapport uh, mediating the response. And this was just measured with a single item. I have a good relationship with the main person or people who will look after me during the upcoming um, experience. Now, it's just noting, you know, uh, review work that has um, sort of critiqued psychotherapy and looked at the different uh, common factors that seem to be important for mediating response are the isolated factors that um, are um, all, also appear now to be very important uh, in mediating responses to psychedelic therapy. One is the therapeutic alliance or therapeutic rapport. Is the relationship good? Uh, the other one, it's a bit cheeky that I put in myth, but in a sense, it's expectations. Uh, its uh, intentions for the uh, for the treatment and the response. Do you believe the story in a sense that this will be therapeutic, that this will help you? And are you willing to engage in the change? And I suppose that brings us on to number three, which is being committed to the change, being willing to actively, you know, change and engage in that process. Now, uh, from the cheeky to the sort of really quite interesting, I think, is uh, that we looked at the myth in a sense, the myth in inverted commas. We measured expectancy in a recent trial that we did, um, this trial comparing psilocybin therapy with a, uh, a um, mainstream, you know, widely used um, antidepressant drug. Uh, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, escitalopram or Lexapro, which was taken for six weeks and one day uh, versus the psilocybin arm, which was two doses, um, three weeks apart of psilocybin with the supportive therapy. So we measured at the start of the trial in the um, 59 people who took part um, what their expectations were for the different treatments independently for escitalopram, what do you predict, what do you expect? And for psilocybin, what do, you, what do you expect? And of course, because this was a randomized trial, so to speak, it's a coin flip on, on what arm you go into. So people don't know what arm they're going to go into of the study, whether they get escitalopram or psilocybin, yet they make that prediction for both. And then at the end of the trial, of course, you know, they go into one of the arms and they actually get that treatment. And then at the end, you can see whether their expectations for the treatment they received is predictive of their response to the treatment that they received. So we did that. 
we did that and, and we found that uh, there was a relationship between the expectations for the SSRI, for escitalopram, these downward slopes are the significant correlations between improvement in mental health outcome with the SSRI, with the escitalopram, and the pretrial expectation for that treatment. Now, was the same true for psilocybin? And the answer is no, it wasn't. So pretrial expectancy wasn't predictive, did not relate to actual response to psilocybin. Pretrial expectancy for psilocybin was not predictive of response to psilocybin. Why am I showing this now? Because I think it matters. What it suggests is that response to psilocybin therapy is not a placebo response. Um, and that then implies a question after you've done the critique of, could there be some other way that accounts for these results, which of course we did, it leaves you with the possibility that maybe psilocybin therapy does something else rather than just the placebo response. And of course, you know, I believe that. And uh, that's part of my sort of, uh, you know, focus of research. And we'll get onto that. Um, so this is where we are right now with these promising results and a treatment that seems to be showing signal in a lot of different uh, psychiatric diagnostic categories or disorders. Um, so does that imply something about the problem? If there's a common solution, psychedelic therapy, that seems to be effective across disorders, does it target the same thing? Is there a common denominator to psychological suffering, if you want, or mental illness? And I think there might be, as others have argued, um, and uh, so then the question is, what is it and what is it mechanistically? So in this recent paper, Canalization and Plasticity and Psychopathology, I offer the possibility that in a sense, the common problem could be described as the inverse of plasticity, um, the inverse of the ability to, to be shaped or molded or to change, which would be a resistance to being shaped or molded or to change. So a resistance to change. And in the context of evolutionary science, there's a name for that. It's called canalization. And the inspiration is the analogy, the metaphor of a canal. A canal is a trench that's dug into the ground intentionally, and water then flows through that canal in a specific direction with no variability. Um, it's, you know, one way or, or no way in a, in a sense. Um, and what I'm suggesting is that that's true of a lot of different psychiatric disorders and may, in fact, be the common factor. And so we could think of the negative cognitive biases in depression or the way people get fixated on their pain and chronic pain disorders. Um, they come to identify with the pain. Um, and um, similarly, in anxiety disorders, especially phobias, specific anxieties, there's a fixation on some trigger of the anxiety. In addictions, there's typically an, an object or a few, um, but not always a huge number, some select objects which are fixated on, which are seen as objects of relief, whether they be drugs, for example, in drug addiction. Um, and so the mind and behavior is rooted in in a way, you know, towards that object of relief. And then in image and eating disorders, there's a fixation on the body, on caloric control, on control generally, and a, yeah, a, a, an entrenchment of, of the mind on, on that uh, domain of control. And then in obsessive compulsive disorder, there could be a fixation on say contamination and, and then, you know, repeated behaviors to try and um, allay the anxiety that is triggered by, you know, intrusive thoughts about things like contamination. Um, so there we have the common space with a solution that is to promote plasticity, to open the mind and presumably the brain up to change and then do it in a way that's psychologically supported, such that when the individual's opened up, that opening up you know, isn't iatrogenic, isn't harmful, but rather is healing 
And that's the model, that psychedelic therapy. It's a combination treatment. As I keep reiterating, it's not just a drug, it's how the drug is used. Now I put this slide in just because it's healthy to remind ourselves that all treatments carry risk. And of course, psychedelics and psychedelic therapy isn't an exception. And so I think it's um, good practice to spend a bit of time on potential risks and risk mitigation. Really, that's the reason to look at risk so that we can better preempt them, screen for them and uh, treat them if they arise in, in terms of treating negative responses. So this is really just a brain dump at the moment. It's a working model with some evidence supporting different components to try and predict to better model those rare but important negative psychological responses to psychedelics or psychedelic therapy when they happen. And what the literature is suggesting at the moment are things like young age seems to be a risk factor. Um, but some of the items I've highlighted are ones that have come up in uh, our own data. One is personality disorder in one data set seem to be disproportionately associated with negative psychological responses, not on average, but those rare but um, relatively marked um, uh, worsenings of, of mental health were um, predicted by a, a past history or a current diagnosis, personal diagnosis of a personality disorder. And that didn't seem to be true of other psychiatric uh, diagnoses. So it's, I just think it's worth, it's preliminary data, it's a small sample, but I think it's worth sowing that seed in people's minds in a sense as a kind of hypothesis generation uh, at this stage. And, and I would say that's how you should see this whole slide really is like just working towards an improved effort to predict uh, those rare, they are rare, but important because they are important negative psychological responses to psychedelics when they occur. So we've seen, you know, endorsing the principle that rapport and therapeutic alliance is important. We've seen that when trust uh, is, or rapport is low, or if there is no supervision whatsoever, then that seems to be a negative, a predictor of negative responses, as does the quality of the experience itself. If it's characterized by um an unpleasant quality, a struggle throughout that's associated with negative uh, responses. Also, the absence of any psychological support afterwards as well seems to be associated, or at least we hypothesize that it would be. Um, so there we are, a work in progress. So this is a, uh, it's a little complicated, but I think it's important. And it's a principle of how the psychedelics are working acutely under the drug, what's happening in the brain. And I call it the entropic brain principle where entropy is a measure of our uncertainty about a phenomenon, about a dynamic phenomenon. Meaning if it's more uh, erratic or random in its behavior, then we're more uncertain about that system. It's more entropic. And so the hypothesis was that psychedelics would do this to the brain. They would make brain activity more entropic. And that's what we found when we tested it. Um, we looked at spontaneous or ongoing brain activity under psychedelics, and we saw that it elevated above its ordinarily quite high level of uh, spontaneous or basal uh, entropy, if you want, during normal waking. Uh, consciousness. And we first reported that um, in 2017. Since then, it's been uh, replicated again and again in different analyses and data sets. And it's now emerging as what I would call a principle rather than a hypothesis. Here I'm showing as yet unpublished data, but we're working on it with 25 milligrams psilocybin in 28 healthy volunteers the increase in brain entropy at hour one and hour two. And then in a separate study entirely, uh, here this correlation is looking at the entropic brain effect, which is very reliable, um, and the magnitude of it and its correlation with the, not just the intensity of the subjective experience, but its quality, and more specifically, 
uh, people's ratings of the richness of their experience. The richer the experience under the DMT, um, the uh, larger the entropic brain effect. We've also seen here in this healthy volunteer data set again, that the entropic brain effect was predictive of things in the future. It was quite strongly predictive of psychological insight scores rated the next day. And then we found that that was further predictive of improvements in mental health outcomes one month later. So if you join the dots, we're seeing a brain effect under drug in a matter of minutes, in a sense, or 60 and 120, predicting a psychological change the next day, which is then predicting a, a mental health improvement one month later. So pretty remarkable that what's going on in the brain so quickly can be predictive of something so far out in terms of improvement in mental health. Um, now, I suspect that this effect is related to some of that stuff I talked about right in the beginning, like the increases in the anatomical plasticity markers, the, the uh, spinogenesis and the dendritogenesis. That's a hypothesis, but uh, hopefully others will come along and test it. Um, we've also seen that other altered states of consciousness um, show the, this entropic brain effect, including things like meditation, uh, rapid eye movement, sleep and dreaming, uh, music impro improvisation, uh, preictal uh, aura, so the uh, dreamy state aura before a temporal lobe uh, seizure, um, and uh, fluid intelligence seems to relate to the complexity of spontaneous brain activity. Um, so that's interesting. And then the, in the other direction, states of reduced consciousness, like in deep sleep or with anesthetics or in disorders of consciousness or in aging or post-stroke or post-stroke depression, and also antipsychotic meds that can cause a degree of sedation, you'll see a decrease in, in the entropy of spontaneous brain activity. So this principle seems important. It's, it's tracking, in a sense, um, conscious level and the quality of, of consciousness time. Okay. So um, other actions of psychedelics on the brain, increasing communication across systems mm -hmm. here with psilocybin, here with LSD, here with DMT, it especially being an effect that targets high level brain networks, in a sense, increasing their spatial extent, sort of um, breaching their uh, boundaries, if you want, and opening them up. Um, and this effect that we're seeing in the brain acutely, we've recently seen as a kind of carryover effect post-acutely. We see it in the brain one day post-treatment with psilocybin therapy for depression and the effect correlated with um, the magnitude of the response to the treatment. And we've also seen it in a second trial of major depressive disorder where three weeks post-treatment of the same decrease in brain modularity or opening up of the brain um, and that correlated also with improvements in symptom severity. So it's an intriguing principle that speaks to intuition of a system that can get stuck in substates, in pathology, get entrenched in those substates in a broad range of psychopathology, like a common factor. And then under drug, that is rectified if you want, the system becomes open and hyperflexible. And now what we've recently seen is that there may be a carryover type effect, a post-acute residue um, carryover of that acute action into the post-acute post-treatment uh, phases. So it's an exciting principle. Time will tell whether it holds up. Another exciting finding is that we're seeing for the first time anatomical brain changes after um, a psychedelic. This is one month after someone's first ever psychedelic experience, in this case, 25 milligrams of psilocybin. And we saw changes in brain anatomy that we didn't see one month after a placebo. And it was in the direction of decreases in the diffusivity of these long cables running from the prefrontal cortex into, into subcortical regions. Um, and it was in the direction that is the opposite of what you see in brain aging and in pathologies of aging, 
and is consistent with the direction of change that you see with healthy development from infancy into adulthood. So it's quite an exciting finding. Um, in the same sample, we saw improvements in psychological well-being and cognitive flexibility, so an aspect of cognition. Um, so it could be a good change. You know, there wasn't an, any evidence that it was a bad change. Um, it's a brain change. And when you look at, you know, mental health and uh, thinking, cognition, then those domains improved in, in this sample one month after, after the psilocybin. In the interests of uh, sort of reducing complexity, I would just say this slide is looking at, a various, at various different properties of the brain, both functional and anatomical, to show that there's a, to my eyes at least, there's a commonality between the spatial pattern or dimension or gradient that seems relevant to the action of psychedelics, both where the target, the main target is of classic psychedelics, and also when you look at the functional brain changes, the, um, the pattern or map of changes of the most pronounced changes also recapitulates this fundamental dimension or gradient that you see in the brain, you know, repeated again and again in different properties of brain function and anatomy. I'm mindful of time, and that's why I'm going a little fast. I think we're going to, we wanted to have 15 minutes for questions, I think. So um, I'll try and stay true to that, unless you tell me otherwise. Um, but uh, so that's why I'm going a little bit swift. Um, let me tell you about the Rebus model. Uh, and um, just interrupt if ever you think you should, otherwise I'll, I'll keep going. We're no, I'm just, I mean, there's, there's gazillions of questions, so I'm just letting you know. <laughs> oh, cool. I think we should honour those gazillions. So let me <laughs> take five, five minutes. Would that work? Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. All right. So the Rebus model takes its inspiration from the hierarchical organisation of the brain to say that psychedelics will target that and especially um, the top-down information flow that is thought to carry the predictive functioning, the predictive processing of the brain ordinarily. And the principle is that the weighting of that top-down information flow, the weighting of the predictions, if you want, through which we experience the world will be relinquished or lightened or reduced or de-weighted uh, under, under psychedelics. And that's something that we've seen when measuring a candidate correlate of, um, of predictive processing in the brain, so-called traveling waves. We saw it very reliably with DMT that there was a flip in the directionality of traveling waves with DMT as people enter the DMT state, um, a flip from a dominant top-down information flow to a resurgent, if you want, um, bottom-up under the drug. As if the model the predictive models of the mind are relinquished and instead there's a kind of hyper receptivity to input whatever its source. Now uh, this was going to be my final slide but uh, I also because <laughs> in the intro we um, were dwelling a little bit on this trial but I think I've covered it a little bit so let me see if we should end here. Here you know I thought what's a way to measure the rebus principle why don't we just directly measure people's confidence in their beliefs so that's what we did here and uh, what we found is that under drug um, three of the four domains of belief belief about positive beliefs about the self like this is just an example i am loved or a uh, a negative belief about another person like this person whoever it is is devious or a negative belief about the self, obviously a key domain or characteristic of depression, like I'm a failure. Uh, so three of these dimensions um, decreased in confidence uh, under drug, but we also saw this, which was intriguing, this enduring decrease in negative self-beliefs one month after the psilocybin. And it, it was an effect that uh, was evident in a healthy volunteer sample. This this is that healthy volunteer study I keep keep referring to, as yet unpublished, but we're working on it. 
Um, but the reason why I show it is because we also had the EEG cap on, and I've told you about the entropic brain effect. When we looked at the magnitude of that effect, we saw that it both correlated with the acute drop in confidence in um, certain beliefs and particularly the negative self-beliefs, um, but not just the acute drop. It was also predictive of the enduring decrease in confidence in the negative self-belief. So again, something happening in the brain under the drug is predicting arguably you know, a key facet of the therapeutic action of psychedelic therapy, the healthy revision of pathologically overweighted beliefs or priors or hypotheses or predictions or assumptions about the self um, uh, with, this, with this intervention. So there we have it. And the rest was really just taking you through the psilocybin for escitalopram trial the fact that it missed on the primary outcome measure and hit on everything else. <laughs> so make your own mind up whether you think that's promising in favor of psilocybin therapy. So all the greens are over 95% confidence that if you were to repeat the sampling, you would see results favoring this arm of the, the two arm study, which is psilocybin versus the other. But one of them, you wouldn't feel over 95% confident and that Sod's law was the pre-registered primary outcome measure. So that dominated the write-up of the paper. No difference here. Do you believe it? I would say, look at the data. Um, <laughs> in terms of uh, the difference between the treatments, um, we saw that emotionality was probably the domain that passed these treatments apart most clearly. SSRIs or escitalopram in this case, blunting both emotionality itself um, here, uh, ability to cry, for example, going down, going up after psilocybin therapy, going down with escitalopram, but also the brain's responsiveness in this case to emotional faces, faces showing different emotional expressions blunted with escitalopram, the SSRI, and uh, mostly no change with psilocybin, but neutral faces, curiously neutral faces versus fixation cross there was an augmentation of the brain's response just to faces themselves with a psilocybin therapy. Maybe you could extrapolate that to increased um, pro-social functioning. That's my slides because you've heard of the expectancy effect that I quite like. And I like to say it suggests psilocybin therapy isn't snake oil as if it ever was, <laughs> but it's not a panacea either. And it does carry risks um, and it needs to be delivered properly. So. Thank you for your attention and look forward to your questions. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, if we can just stop sharing now. And um, firstly, I just want to comment on, you know, having um, heard you present on many occasions for a number of years now, uh, it's really fascinating to, to listen to and watch how your research and your understanding is evolving in this field. And um, it's really, yeah, very interesting. How are you finding what what you're able to do in San Francisco versus being in um, Imperial College? Yeah, well, it was it it was good there, <laughs> and it's good here. I guess the difference is uh, um, it takes time to get the research itself going, but we're about to start dosing for our newest study, which is a a deep dive into psychedelic substates and trying to deepen our understanding of what's going on, not just in the psychedelic experience, but in certain facets of the psychedelic experience. So mm. that's where we're going next. We're starting to, to sort of dive deeper on some of these questions. And I think it was fascinating seeing your sort of starting thoughts on the, um, you know, potential um, side effects for certain types of individuals and so on that was a really interesting starting piece of work that will be fascinated to see more of um, as you develop it further but look there's so many questions here um, I'm going to try and batch some of them together um, what these questions for example like what about um, what's the difference if someone has a stronger intention when they go into the treatment versus someone who doesn't and then also, what is the importance uh, for you as a scientist of the, the mystical experience and how do you feel 
uh, that really plays its way out in, in the healing process. Sure. The, the intentions one's uh, kind of easy in a sense in that we've measured it and found that it matters. So if people have a therapeutic intention, they do have better responses. If their intention is for escapism, then they're, they're more likely to have a negative response. So intentions matter in getting the intentions right in terms of being open, being willing to explore those are associated with the better outcomes. Now, the mystical type experience, um, I just think it's a work in progress. Uh, um, you know, a colleague of mine said recently that there are two aspects to the psychedelic experience or the, or the therapeutic um, response to psychedelics. There's, the, there's a, a dimension that's more psychological, and then there's a mystical dimension. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> The mystical dimension, how is that not, not psychological, you know? <clears throat> That's my issue, if you want, with, with some of the thinking and uh, uh, around uh, the mystical type experiences that there's, uh, there could, there's the potential for a kind of lack of groundedness about the construct and, and a sort of a, a, a danger of getting lost in the mysticism of the mystical type experience. So you know, sort of succumbing to the idea that it's something beyond the brain. I think it's, personally, I think it's quite dangerous. I think it's antithetical to, you know, the naturalism, naturalism philosophy of science, basically, that, um, you know, that we can come to understand these things. And, and presumably, like all other subjective experiences, the so-called mystical type experience is still an experience of the body and of the brain and of nature, and that it's not supernature, it's not supernatural, and that we should work towards a better understanding of it. So mm -hmm. I think that's really important, and that's that's my view on it. That's why I think, it, and also in the data, while yes, it seems to be predictive of therapeutic response, the emotional breakthrough or emotional cathar catharsis experience is more strongly predictive of therapeutic response. So I just think it's a work in progress. I think in time, it might drift away as we begin to demystify um, some, of, some of the phenomenology and better understand it. Thank you for that. And then there's questions about the younger stage that trial participants have been, you know, you've been doing, I think you were involved in that anorexia um, eating disorders trial in Imperial. What's the sort of younger stage that you feel at the moment, it's safe for these treatments to, to be undertaken with. Yeah, well, well, the I think the bottom age is 21 in, in our anorexia trial. Um, might even be a little bit older in that trial. But it's, okay. you know, which is an issue because, of course, anorexia typically uh, affects young people especially, and that's where there's tragic risk and you know tragic risk of premature death with anorexia being the most uh, deadly psychiatric disorder um, mm. so i do know of colleagues who are now bravely thinking about going into um you know adolescent populations with psilocybin therapy and uh, i think that research needs to be done and but of course of course needs to be done very carefully but remember that this is a deadly disorder that kills young people. So uh, uh, there's, there's extreme risk in the disorder itself. So these things should always be weighed up, you know, what's the potential mm -hmm. for benefit versus potential for harm. Exactly. Uh, honestly, yeah, we don't yet really know uh, about safety in younger people, but I am seeing in data, I am seeing in data, it, it has doesn't come from a, a prior assumption as such as seeing the data and having my mind changed that when you look at negative psychological responses they do seem to disproportionately cluster in younger people and is that because younger people are taking psychedelics with less education and more recklessness possibly possibly or maybe their you know ego development is 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 immature and that puts them at special risk. So and it could be a combination of those things. So I would say at the moment, looking at some of this early data and it converging on young age being a risk, I think there are reasons to have a bit of a cautionary message about psychedelic therapy in younger people. 
Well, thank you. Just um, just a show of hands. I just want to have a look at the gallery and just see um, who who's a practitioner on on this call. Hands up if you're practitioners. Thank you so much. Okay, lots and lots of people. <laughs> All right. Thank you for the great work that you're doing. Um, Robin, do you want to comment just on the need to be off current medications and the tapering just very briefly? I mean, obviously, it's a much longer conversation, but we always get a lot of questions about that. Yeah, well, it's a really difficult one. And um, the truth, again, is no one fully knows the answer. So what we found in our escitalopram psilocybin um, trial was that um, uh, those who were not on any antidepressant medication coming in did fabulously well to psilocybin therapy and did quite poorly to escitalopram. However, if people came in and they discontinued antidepressant meds when they came in, there was little, if any, difference, I think. It certainly diminished the difference between psilocybin therapy and escitalopram. You know, it was a closer race, if you want, between those two treatments. And there could be a few reasons for that. There could be, you know, a bias maybe against the antidepressants in those who were um, medication free coming in. They're just medication um, averse. Uh, uh, it could be that the medication has changed people in a way that desensitized them to psilocybin therapy. There's some suggestive evidence that being on the medications and staying on them diminishes the subjective effects of psychedelics. Um, so there's a, it was an intriguing finding and there's a question mark that hangs over that space. There's a couple of what I would say weak pieces of evidence at this stage that you that and also a lot of bias, a lot of like conflict of interest that suggests that you could stay on your antidepressants and still get benefits from psychedelic therapy. I, I haven't really seen evidence that's of sufficient quality to to really believe that principle yet. Um, and you can see why people would want it to be true, but be, beware of those you know, that kind of wishful thinking, like the non-psychedelic psychedelics, you know, get the benefit without the trip. Oh, I was going to ask you about, I was going to ask you about them actually, Ron. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, do you think there's validity to that theory? I struggle to see the logic and I, uh, and I see a lot of wishful thinking and, and maybe also a bit of conflict as well in terms of conflict of interest, because wouldn't it be convenient if you could mm -hmm. get the therapeutic response with just the drug, wouldn't that neatly fit the medical model of, you know, drug alone that dominates, you know, medicine, including mm. mental health care? Wouldn't it be convenient? But whether it's true is another matter. And I just struggle with the logic because, um, you know, if the logic's true, you can hit the target receptor and stimulate it and not get the trip, but first of all, I just don't see any evidence for that, at least in the human being. Um, and then also it seems to go, you can hit the receptor and stimulate it, not get the trip, but get the therapeutic effect. But again, the evidence for that at the moment is in mice. And uh, there's just a lot of false positives in mice modeling of mental illness and, and its treatment with drugs. And so I, I'm skeptical. I think, it, I think it's a false positive. And I don't think those drugs that have come through in mice models will come through in humans. If they do, we should all feel good about it because it means there's another treatment option for patients that is a similar model maybe to current uh, chronic pharmacotherapy, being on a drug every day for however many weeks or months. You know, more of the same if you want, and but a different, a different action, a different pharmacology. So people should be pleased that yes, more of the same, but a different pharmacology, but more of the same in terms of being chronic pharmacotherapy. The reason why I'm a little sensitive about it is that like psychedelic therapy is such a paradigm shift to the to the normal model. It's not more of the same. It's about a treatment that opens people up and combines it with psychological intervention, psychological support um, that's, you know, intrinsically more holistic 
and I think truer to the problem in the first place, which is arguably a biopsychosocial problem. You know, it's not just biology gone wrong. It's biology going wrong in a complex context. And if that's appreciated, you then realize, well, maybe the solution needs to be biopsychosocial as well. So that's why it's a bit of a sensitive one for me. It's like, you know, in a sense, it's like, yeah, it's uh, it's not really getting it when it comes to psychedelic medicine or psychedelic therapy and, and what it actually is and why it's exciting. You know? You're uh, you're expressing this so well, Robin. It's really um, wonderful, and I'm sure we're all learning an enormous amount from you. Um, there's uh, just just a couple of things I want to mention. Firstly, there's a question here. If we run out of time for Professor Robin to answer our questions, yes, we can have them answered. Or if you send them through, we'll make sure they're answered either by us or by Robin. Uh, so we understand there are an enormous amount of questions. There's a question here. Um, do you have any insight as to whether American psychologists can currently use psychedelics in conjunction with therapy? I'm a psychology student in Australia and the TGA's recent decision currently only allows psychiatrists to use these substances in therapy. So I just want to clarify that for a moment. Peter will come and say hello for a moment. Peter, if you... Hi, Good day, Robin. <laughs> hey, Peter, how are you doing? Good to see you. Oh, like Christ, good to see you. <laughs> yeah, look, look, just in Australia, uh, yes, psychiatrists post July the 1st provided they're pres authorised prescribers. Uh, I don't pretend to have knowledge of America. Uh, but, but my understanding was that they couldn't be used outside of trials in America. But Robin, you're, you're much closer to that than I am. Yeah, I don't think they can, unless I'm missing something. I, I think, uh, you know, federal policy is that they're Schedule 1 and uh, use and sale is, is you know, strictly prohibited. Um, and, and sure, there's the Oregon Initiative, um, but that is, you know, clinician administered with a license. Uh, license to sell, license to practice, license to host. So it's um, it's it's with the possible exception of of Oregon, um, and then later, you know, Colorado when they're ready to roll out, um, uh, it, it it's prohibited to my knowledge. Which again, for everyone on the call, that's why. Uh, my medicine worked on rescheduling for you know close to four years because it really does uh, place Australia now at the vanguard to actually see these therapy therapies used in clinical practice but under very restrained conditions which is as as it should be, as um, it should be. thank you Robin um, there's also a question here about has there been any research on whether someone's proclivity to surrender to a psych psychedelic experience could predict positive outcomes. For example, is if there's a way to train people to let go, surrender, relinquish attachment to the experience or life in general. I mean, obviously that's coming through the end of life, um, some of the end of life uh, studies as well, Robin. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, meditation, I suppose, is trying to promote that letting go. Mm. So if there's a practice, you know, that, uh, in and of itself, of course, meditation and like meditation retreats are known not to be entirely safe, you know, but that doesn't mean that on average, they're very healthy and, and that it's a healthy practice and, and potentially a very noble one. Um, so I think, uh, you know, that might be a way to practice the mind and practice the process of letting go. Maybe there are other ways that are, that are, are safe. Um, maybe in the future, there are ways to use technology through things like virtual reality to practice letting go and surrendering uh surrendering to an experience um so um and actually um the expectancy result was a very curious one but there's another bit to the story which is worth mentioning especially at this stage teed up with that question which is that when we measured trait suggestibility at baseline even though expectancy for psilocybin wasn't predictive of response to psilocybin, trait suggestibility was predictive of response to psilocybin. So people who are more suggestible um, had a better response to psilocybin therapy. So that's interesting. That's interesting. And, you know, suggestibility correlates with other psychological traits like openness. 
like uh, absorption, the ability to be, uh, or the readiness or proclivity to be immersed in stuff like art or nature and feel immersed, fully immersed in, in your surroundings. So, mm. you know, that's perhaps what well, also, you know, to um, develop a therapeutic rapport, hyper suggestibility, suggestibility up as a trait, you know, greater openness uh, to the development of a strong therapeutic alliance. So it may be that that trait suggestibility is, is sort of someone who's already quite malleable and, and open to this. And then the different, what you might call extra pharmacological components of psychedelic therapy, like the therapeutic rapport, maybe the experience, maybe the insight, kind of gripping on to that, you know, that trait, you know, ripeness for, for this treatment. No, thank you, Robin. Um, there's also, I mean, there, there's so many questions. But, um, it's, it's hard to keep track of them all, but um, there's questions also, someone's doing a literature review on Parkinson's. Um, do you have any comments about Parkinson's? We've been getting quite a lot of inquiries on that lately and the potential for treatment through psilocybin assisted therapy. Yeah, a colleague of mine's looking at it at UCSF. He's looking at mood symptoms and more specifically depression. I think it's specifically depression in people with Parkinson's. And um, it's not for me to sort of share any preliminary findings. Um, uh, but then he, I think he's mentioning it publicly. So, you know, I, I guess uh, that's seen. I think he'd be okay with me saying, you know, one thing I've heard from from Josh Woolley leading that study and also his colleague Andrew Penn is that they're not making the Parkinson's worse. And so that's important. And then are they, yeah, that matters, of course. Um, and then the question would be, are they improving the depressive symptoms? And uh, we shall wait and see. Um, are they improving the Parkinson's? I would say that's a bit of a leap. And uh, um Let's not get carried away. But, you know, people are looking, they are looking at neurological disorders now. And I, personally, I wouldn't have gone for Parkinson's if I thought that there might be the potential to treat, um, you know, such pathologies of aging or neurological disorders, um, you know, pathologies of brain aging. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe dementia would have been where I'd, why, where I'd have gone. But Hopkins are doing that. Um, yeah. Yeah, we shall see. That's that's absolutely fascinating work. Um, there's a question here. Many people describe having an experience of looping thoughts while doing psychedelics. How might this relate to the default mode network? Yeah, I, I would step back and say a, a little bit, you know, I, I playfully or cheekily, as I said, um, mentioned, you know, do you believe the myth? You know, being a component of response to psychedelic therapy, how much are you sort of sold on? on the belief that this is gonna help you. Um, and uh, I would say the default mode network is a bit of a myth. And I'll put my hands up and say early on, you know, perhaps I placed too much focus on our results that were highlighting the default mode network. You'll have noticed in my presentation, I don't think I mentioned it once. Uh, the default mode network is one of, you know, a, a series of high level networks that seem to be impacted by psychedelics in a similar way they get dysregulated, they disintegrate in a sense, or their integration decreases, but they also spread out. They become less constrained and segregated from each other and from the rest of the brain. So when someone's looping, um, having repetitive looping thoughts, and it's quite a classic thing. It's like stereotypies in, in, um, in, uh, schizophrenia say or or like um you know I, I, I forget the term like an agitation of mind you know and it, and it is has this very curious sort of cycling quality to it um and often it's unpleasant and you don't want it but you just keep doing this thing over and over a little bit like the compulsions in in OCD and I think it's a defensive response I think it's an effort to control you know, the irresistible um, 
chaos in the sense of of the of the core drug effect it's like a pushback against that and just like just like an ocd maybe you know these compulsions are again an effort to control when otherwise letting go is terrifying um so does it relate to the default mode network we don't know maybe maybe it would um i tend to think that you know states of um of of kind of resisting the psychedelic experience probably look like a diminishment in the core drug effect like the entropic brain effect it's probably when people are fighting the trip it's probably lessening the core brain effects of of the drug it's like the mind fighting against the drug um trying to bring sobriety back in and using which is different... why which is i guess why the dosing and and the set and setting are so critical to that yeah where you know it, the clumsy you know blunt tool way to do it would be add in more dose but that mm. it, that's just a very crude way to try and blast through defenses you know mm. whereas uh, the, there should be more sophistication and finesse i think to psychedelic therapy than just oh, oh absolutely must need more drug you know well, it was interesting yeah. i was speaking to some somatic therapists last week and they were saying that you know, if the if the psychotherapeutic support is right and there's a more somatic somatic element to it, then the actual dosing can go down. So I think there's a real nuance that needs to be studied further in that respect. Yeah. Um, do you think this can ever be a first line treatment before others? Why not? You know, why <laughs> not? If the evidence, I mean, I, you saw the evidence. It was one small study, the the trial we did against escitalopram, but we did it that way because, you know, not everyone wants to take an SSRI and, and they don't like the side effects. And why should that be first line? And should I not be able to have the option? And I can't always get psychotherapy. I'm on a waiting list for six months. I can't afford, you know, private psychotherapy. So it's SSRIs or, or nothing. Like I have to have them if I have depression. That's uh, so the option the option you know framed another way could the system ever accommodate psychedelic therapy as first line because it's cost effective enough to be integrated into the system you know to be first line in say a public health care system that's a bigger ask you know probably mm -hmm. not but could you at least have the option which i guess that then means private and um, there it's a much more compelling argument in favor no thank you robin um, so there's this there's a few questions here also about the training and so on and I just want to mention that the next intakes of the CPAC course will commence on July the 16th but if you want to get into those intakes you need to apply now because there's an enormous list of uh, people applying and just again to reiterate that this is not just psychiatrists who will be sitting in a room with patients Psychiatrists are the screeners and prescribers, but of course, all different disciplines will be very important to provide that multidisciplinary team approach to put the patients at the centre of, of these treatments and at the centre of the healing process. Um, I'm just going to see, I, I'm very conscious of the time and you've got to go to bed and go to sleep, Robin. Um, I'm just going to see, and obviously, other than a psychologist who can administer and undertake follow-on integration therapy, that can be anyone ranging from psychotherapists to social workers, counsellors, mental health nurses. There's a whole range of people who are potentially able to be trained and are being trained both in Australia and the US and other places. Um, very curious, is it psilocybin or psilocin, mm -hmm. someone says, that's truly showing the effects? <laughs> Robin, you're on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, you're still on mute. Scott, can you unmute him, please? Sorry, we'll fix this up. Just a moment. Oh, I'm see you. Trying to unmute myself. Sorry, Robin. <laughs> it's all right. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> Gosh, sorry, I've I've even lost the question now. Uh, sorry. Uh, psilocybin, psilocybin or psilocin that well, has psilocin. The... <laughs> I mean, yeah, psilocin is. is the... Is the metabolite that's stimulating the 2A receptors. So that's absolutely right. The thing is, the drug is psilocybin because it's more stable. That's all it is. It stores better. But once it's in the body, it's rapidly metabolized. And, and uh, we think it becomes psilocin in the body. 
and then in in the brain it's uh, working on the 2a receptors as psilocin thank you robin um question here if there'll be a register of psychiatrists available in sydney who administer absolutely there'll be a register of psychiatrists in different states and all those protocols and standard operating procedures are being set up at the moment and um, people have to set up um, their own ethics um, committee protocol so that they can get approvals. And we are having that webinar on April the, I think it's the 27th, April the 27th with Dr. Ben Sessor and psychiatrists for psychiatrists. So if you're a psychiatrist or psychiatry register, then please join that, that call, um, that webinar, I mean. There's a, there's a lovely comment here. You've given me a tiny bit of hope for a better future. 11 years in PTSD hell. Can't see myself living for too many years. Please hang in there, Sharon. We all want you to hang in there. And there is absolute hope. So for all of you that are suffering out there, we, we hear you. Our hearts go out to you. And to all of the clinicians on here, just thank you so much for all the work you do in the community. It's, it's incredible. And for all the researchers who are evolving this field. And, and understanding how these treatments can be used in different conditions. We're very grateful. We know there's more questions, but we have to finish and let Robin go. But we will answer those questions if you send them through to us. And we look forward to seeing you again very soon, Robin. And all of you, um, we invite you to our next webinars. And a huge round of applause to you, Robin. That was absolutely um, inspirational. Thank you. Thank lovely you very much. <laughs> no, lovely, lovely to see you and love to the family from us too. Thank you guys and to you guys and well done. Thank um, you. Good Thanks so much. Hero's journey. <laughs> Trying Thanks for listening, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Take care. Blessings. <laughs>